Welcome back to the Curious John Podcast. My name is Cindy Huffington and I am your host and I am joined today by two people. I'm joined by Kim and Adriana. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Happy uh, to be here. Thanks for joining. You know, I'm excited for this conversation because it's one that I have not had yet in five seasons and I think it's very needed. Starting from a screen perspective, you know, we talk a lot about screens and media for kids and sometimes it gets often gets a bad rep. Um, and I think that we need to look at it really from a different lens today in terms of educational and, and what we can really help, what we can teach our kids and how it can guide us through that, um, including diversity and, and inclusion. So by the end of today, I'm hoping that parents have this sort of blueprint of what they can do um, to, to have these conversations and where they could begin and so on. So how about we we start by understanding a little bit more about the work that you both do um, with One Fish, Two Fish? Okay, well, I'm the director of One Fish, Two Fish Consulting, and One Fish, Two Fish is actually a company that helps content creators make the best content they can using social science insights and research and, you know, authentic voices to have inclusion and diversity and all of those kinds of things. So really, it came out of what started actually at Toronto Metropolitan University, where we created the Children's Media Lab because we didn't see enough research, in particular in Canada, but just research in general that was saying, hey, what are we seeing on screens? What's missing? And what can content creators do about it? So really, both of the organizations are about bridging this gap between content creators and academia and academic thought and all of the things that we can use to help content creators make better content. Uh, so that's kind of the summary of the two organizations. And I know, Adriana, you probably want to add something on. Yeah, I mean, um, we do kind of a mix of everything, um, depending on what people ask us to do. But we look at to make sure that kids shows and apps and things like that are representative of the population um, and kids real experiences. Um, we talk to kids, we get their perspectives, we talk to parents um, and we just make sure those authentic voices are behind the scenes and making sure that content creators kind of know the research, just like Kim said, that's out there and what they can do to improve their, their content to make it better for kids. One of the big problems is content creators often don't know what they don't know. Mm. If you're doing a show that's about science, you say, okay, I better have a science expert on my show. Mm -hmm. But where there's the more general issues about how kids are, who they are, um, how things are affecting them in the world, all of those kind of other things, how not seeing themselves reflected, all, all of that stuff. That's not just saying I'm doing a science show or a math show or an early literacy show. That's something else. And that's hard for a producer or writer, directors to have all of those skills. They might be good at one particular thing, but to know all of that. And that's, I think, part of why we started both the organizations, because Oftentimes they don't have the time or know where to look or even know what they don't know. And it's not to say they don't want to do their best and aren't trying really hard. It's just some, you know, that's it. We're try trying to just help enhance and bring attention to some of those issues. And there are other organizations that do this kind of thing as well. But, you know, we really came at it, I think, with a Canadian focus and trying to get Canadian de data that was relevant and really useful to content creators in Canada. Can you take us a little bit behind the scenes of what happened? So we think of shows that our kids are watching right now. My kids are really into Bluey every single day. <laughs> and so am I actually. Um, but, you know, when I think of the TV shows and I had a bit of a, a glimpse of what happens when I joined Kids Green uh, in, in Miami this year, which blew me away, like just the, the back end of everything that we don't realize and how many people are involved, <laughs> which I had no idea before. Um, Kim, your background is in kids media, right? So yes. what is sort of, I guess, uh, a two minute kind of summary, because I know there's a lot that happens behind the scenes, but what is the process when we see these shows on screen? Like what happened before and, and how do we bring in the educational content and the content of diversity that you guys are talking about? I think it's an excellent question because it's hard to kind of figure that part out. And like anything else, it takes a long time, right? So generally a show gets pitched and a streaming service or a broadcast or a production company says, let's let's work on this. And there's a period of development. And in that period of development, you know, a lot of things happen. There's often a writer's Bible that's created, a production Bible about what, what you want to achieve, all of those types of things. But it actually, and then it depends on the production in terms of how much time they want to put into, you know, focus testing it with kids. Maybe they come to One Fish and say, hey, can you focus test it? And we'll see if this comedy is working, if kids understand this part. 
Not all projects do that. They're, it's more common in preschool and it's more common when you're working with educational broadcasters or those who have an educational goal at the end of the road. So, but that's sometimes part of the process. And as I mentioned earlier, you might bring in a consultant that's an expert on something, whether it's an expert in math or bringing in us and we say, oh, there's a character who's Cree or a character who's has a limb difference. And let's make sure we bring in our authentic consultants because we have this diversity of consultants on our team now to come in and help you make sure that that's accurately written. So sometimes there's a lot of that that happens during the process. And then the production part can be up to two years if it's an animated show, because there's a, you know, there's a writer, producer, there's directors, there's even in animation, there's a person who's in charge of the animation team. There is a person who does one specific thing. You might have a show that does if it's stop motion, for example, you might have 10 booths set up and everybody does three seconds in a week. Uh, so there's, you know, it's different. A live action show is very different because it can be done in a shorter amount of time. But, you know, animation has really increased over the last number of years. And a big part of that is it's easier to sell because you can add your own local languages to it. So uh, it's becoming even more popular and there's a, you know, there's a business reason for that. So there's a lot of process. And then even within that process, now it's harder to get a show made. It's harder to have the financing to get it made. So let's say you get a local broadcaster, a streaming service, but then you might need some other money. So there might be two other or three other partners around the world who are in on a project. So now you've got your production company and the executive at your company giving notes to the production. There might be somebody at this other company giving notes and somebody at this. So you can see how there's already a lot of voices. Yes. So sometimes content creators don't go outside and say, oh, let's add another one and get those consultants yes. to give us some more feedback because they feel like there's a lot. So again, I don't think it's you know, not because people aren't trying to make the best projects. I think it's really, there's a lot going on. There's time pressures and there's budget pressures. So you really have to have the a moment to stop and think, and I'm all, we're always saying this to content creators, try to build in those moments mm -hmm. to stop and think about things, right? Those moments are what makes that change happen. And so, but anyway, it's, but some of them do because they think about it because they're making a mash show or they're making a, you know, a digital balance show like Dot, that Henson show, where it's like, how do you balance these things? There's all sorts of great shows that go outside, but oftentimes they're racing to finish the show. And that's where sometimes we see something we think, oh, I wish we'd been able to be a part of that. Because it's sometimes just little things, small tweaks, small changes, just an understanding of things that makes things a little bit different. Speaking of that, what are things that you got you are both seeing in in TV shows or even apps that make you say like we're we're in the right direction? And then opposite to that, what are things that you're seeing where you tell yourself, "I wish we would have consulted on that because there were little changes that we could have made and, and to improve that." Well, we can say with some whatever. I don't think there's a show that you can't watch and say there might have been something different mm -hmm. that could have happened here because we're nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. We all make mistakes no matter what. I, you know, I think all the things I did when I was the head of CDC Children's Department here, where it's, I look back and I think, oh, I wish I'd done this one thing. And I had a developmental psychologist as my main preschool um, expert on the day. Like you did everything you can, but you still can't do it all perfectly. Mm -hmm. But I think in general, we're seeing a big change in the last, say, five or six years after George Floyd's death, mm -hmm. you know, the discovery of uh, Black Lives Matter matter, the discovery of the Indigenous graves in Canada, that was a major change point in terms of people becoming more aware. So now there is so much more conversation just in, you know, you went to kids screen, you mentioned, so I'm sure you heard a lot more about inclusion, diversity, mm -hmm. belonging. How do we do authentic storytelling? These are all buzzwords now. But I, so we've seen a lot of change as people have kind of turned a little bit to, to pay more attention to those things. So we're seeing a better balance of gender, as an example, of race inclusion, as another example. But we still see like some areas that are lagging, you know, re like reflection of, you know, all the communities. Um, so there's some that are like South Asian is a burgeoning, growing uh, community in North America and lagging behind in terms of the numbers, Indigenous um, characters. But we're also seeing... Uh, a need to do more around disabilities, characters with disabilities, neurodiverse characters, and to us LGBTQ characters. Those are still a little bit lower on the priority. And of course, there's lots of politics right now around 
um, some of those issues that play a, a role in particular around to us LGBTQ mm-hmm. plus issues. So, I mean, I think those are the things we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of improvement, but also some things that are missing. And I don't know if I've missed anything off of that list that you want to add, Adriana. Yeah, no, that was pretty extensive. But um, I guess my expertise or my research expertise is gender. Um, And so one of the things I notice is like, you know, the research says that we are doing better in terms of, you know, having a 50-50 male-female ratio. Um, However, there's no non-binary characters in preschool televisions. Um, And so it's really interesting actually to be behind the scenes and read some of these show Bibles and things because even though this research is out there, content creators are writing to their own like unconscious biases and things like that, which behind the scenes research does show is more male. Um, So, you know, we're seeing these STEM characters, for example, and you, you read the description and then there's the name and the pronouns and it's more often than not, it's he, him, you know, and it's just super, super fascinating to me because all the research shows this these stats about how it's unequal and then it doesn't it's not getting to the content creators and again like Kim said before it, it's not their fault um and but that's one of the main things that we we do is like point out these things and be like you know why don't we just switch this to be a girl and mm-hmm. the characteristics and the description can stay exactly as it is um nothing else needs to change you know so it's it is you know on the surface about gender and race and disabilities but it's also who they are as characters, what are their complexities, what's in their descriptions, like who are their personalities, that they shouldn't just be these one-dimensional females wearing bows that, (laughs) you know? Um, Or like a bow. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) definitely are getting better and we're seeing those changes, but I think there's still a lot of room for growth and for the research to just get out there and for even parents to be aware of these things while they're watching shows with their kids that they can talk about these things you know if they're seeing stereotypes just have a conversation with your child and be like you know not every girl or or boy is like this you can also be like this and this and this um so I think it's just having that diversity on all ends and all fronts is super important I remember during my PhD, I was part of this program called Brain Reach, and we would go into classrooms, grade three classrooms, and we were neuroscientists, and we would show up with a cow brain sometimes, we'd show up with different parts or things from the lab. And when we'd show up, the first thing we do when we'd say hi is ask every single student to draw a scientist. What does a scientist look like? And I think it was like 90% of the drawings looked like Einstein and had like the mad scientist hair. They were males. Even the girls were drawing males. And we ran a study because what we saw at the end of the year after we were going there every single month. And by the end of the school season, um, they, when we asked them to draw a scientist, kids were drawing themselves or a girl or, you know, just a, just it looked very different than their first drawing. And I, I get the point of having this kind of diversity and in, and, 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 you know, TV shows and kids, what kids are watching. Because it's not just about seeing somebody different, but it's seeing themselves too, right? Like seeing yourself in that character. Um, You mentioned, you know, very intense topics that I know many parents might say, how do I talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter or what's happening with the Indigenous community or what we're here learning about? Is that something that is coming into a preschool show? And if so, is that something I should be having a conversation with my child about? And where do I begin? So how can you guide parents in terms of that or what's being brought into kids media? Well, I think one of the things, you know, that we would recommend and is really talking from an early age when we're talking about, you know, preschool media, you know, you mentioned before that, you know, media is this controversial. Everyone's like, "Eh," has thoughts about it, (laughs) but the truth is it's everywhere. And no matter who you're, you know, how hard you try, your kids are going to be exposed to media and it's going to be a part of, of your family life. So talking about media literacy, talking about the things that you see on screen. And a lot of that is about, um, you know, race representation, gender representation, you know, gender performativity. How are we seeing the moms and dads uh, acting? What are they doing when we're watching a show? You know, when we're watching a show like Peppa Pig, which has lots of people saying things about it, Mm -hmm. you know, oh, there's dad going off to work. There's mom staying at home doing the laundry. Like there's all of those kinds of in things that we're seeing. So whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's that, you know, Paw Patrol, another huge show. So there's, you know, it started off in the first year with seven characters. There was one female character and six male characters. And the female character was smaller, quieter, shyer, more caring and nurturing and had a yeah. pink 
a smaller outfit. There's so many of those little things that you can be talking about. So you don't have to, I think it's overwhelming to think, how do I deal with talking about these yeah. big issues? And you really have to just start talking. And I think you start talking when you start watching and, you know, making it about what do you see? You know, it's, you know, cause preschoolers, I mean, it's a great thing about preschoolers. They have healthy imaginations, mm -hmm. everything they see. It's like, yeah, that's real. And that's part <laughs> of the problem, right? Yeah. Because what they see, if they think what they see, is real, then, you know, it's going to have an impact them on them. So you need to be having those conversations. Oh, did you notice, you know, in our family, there's, you know, X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. But when we were watching these two shows we watched today, what did you see? Like, what did the families look like? And that's, you know, you just need to start talking and talking. I have a 15 year old son and he's a guy who plays video games. And in many ways, he's a typical guy um, who likes his interests, but he has me for a mom. So, you know, we, I just started talking at a young age and, you know, he'd watch stuff and we just talked about it. And now I am amazed at what he will say to me that he might even notice in a show that I don't notice because I, you know, you've just kind of, you have to start training your kids to be critical thinkers. Media literacy is not a course at school. It's, they kind of weave it where, depending on where you are, it's woven throughout subjects, but never really addressed early enough and enough, period. So having just talking about what you see on screens and not being shy about actually using language. You know, there's that study last year at a Paramount um, in Nickelodeon and Noggin where, you know, they interviewed parents and families and, you know, white families talked about racism in soft terms, whereas, you know, you know, non-white families had more like they were more honest and open and spoke real language in terms like racism versus helping and involving everyone, which mm -hmm. your white families did. So it's those kind of things, starting to talk and have those conversations and not be afraid to use correct language. And as, you know, as kids age, they'll just start to understand a little bit more. So at first, you're just maybe pointing out and comparing it to other things that they can actually compare and contrast to. Oh, you're, you know, your school, do you notice how kids at your school, like they look different than what we're seeing on this show. Um, so it's those just little things that you notice. Every show on, preschool show seems to have a family living in a house with a driveway. Well, <laughs> You know, in 10 years, or I think it's 10 or 15 years, 90% of us will live in cities. So are we living in, is that where we're living in houses with driveways? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. We're living in semi-detached houses and apartments. and cars. So it's even that kind of stuff can just get kids to start talking and developing those skills so that they start to talk more and, you know, start to develop those concrete skills because the future is about critical thinking skills and being able to watch media and think about it and notice something is a, just a really terrific way to start, even with younger preschoolers. And they do have a lot of questions. And I think that's where parents sometimes hesitate, right? Because what if there's a question that I can't answer? I, I'm thinking of a scene um, from Sesame Street when they introduced the character, the autistic um, character. This was a couple of years ago. I think there was a scene where I don't know if it was Elmo or another character was singing Twinkle Twinkle and and she or singing a song or singing something to her, speaking to her, and she wasn't responding. And my kids had asked me, like, why is she ignoring them? And it just led to that conversation of some people are different and some kids might not respond the same way. It doesn't mean they don't want to be friends with you, but you can still be kind to them. And so we had it. At, they were young at that time. So, it, it, you know, I tried to have it at their level. But you mentioned disabilities. And I, I agree with you. I think we should see that a lot more because then it helps us have that conversation within our home. Because then kids will often point it out really loudly in public and say like, what's wrong, right? With, And I, I think it's so nice to have that opportunity in the home to say, there's nothing wrong. They're different and they have different, you know, so how, what would you, how would you guide a parent who's listening in terms of disabilities and, and how to move forward with that in terms of a conversation with a young child? Well, I think, and I know Adriana will want to add on to this, but I think the basic is what you're talking about. When you say someone's different, like pointing out same and different is a really lovely way to start, like mm -hmm. just starting to understand those differences. But, you know, earlier we talked about like media being everywhere. It's like remembering that it's a, it's a mirror and it's mm -hmm. a window. So, you know, a mirror means like my son is hard of hearing. So a mirror means when he sees a character, which isn't 
uh, doesn't happen very often, but there's an amazing one in Dragon Prince, just as an mm-hmm. aside, that General Amaya, the leader of the of the army who's amazing. And the storyline is written about her amazingness and the deafness isn't like this, oh, and she's deaf. It's just integrated in a way that makes her character even stronger. There's a comedy element and all sorts of things. So I cannot tell you what happened when he saw that character Mm -hmm. because it was so exciting for him. And that's what happens with kids because they see a character who looks like them, whether it's the color of their skin, the way they're acting, um, you know, where they live. Oh, that's it. You know, in an apartment building, just like us, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, but it's also an important part in terms of a window for them to start to see that there are, as you mentioned, this character is different and this person is different. And why? Because it's really important for kids to understand that there's a myriad of different people that make up the world. World, and all of us together is what makes everything so amazing. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think it's a, important to like, to, just that simple language of that there's is. some people are the same and different is great. And I'll throw it to you, Adriana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing, like acknowledging that there's differences, I think is the best thing that you can do. And it, it doesn't mean you have to go into the really tough topics, but recognizing those differences and celebrating them and just making your your kids understand what that means and about who they are um i think is is so valuable even if it does mean you know like parents might get tripped up and <laughs> not know what to say but just pointing those simple things out it doesn't have to go into like these deep conversations about why or how come but it just pointing out that there are differences and it's okay that they're different but we can still treat them with kindness and respect. Um, and, you know, media is such a great platform to do that, that like mm-hmm. kids can get exposed to so many different cultures and groups of people if they if they don't have that around them in their environments. But media is such an important way for them to do that. They can see these characters on screen and have those conversations with their parents. And then that way, when they do go to a store, you know, maybe they're not calling out someone. Because <laughs> they'll understand. Um, yeah. they'll, they'll know. It, yeah. it normalizes, right? That's exactly. what the media can do. Mm-hmm. It can normalize, oh, th- this is normal, right? That's mm-hmm. part of what the great things, and that's why we're, we're, encouraging so much. And I want to just touch on something you had mentioned too, Cindy, just the whole thing about what you did where you had kids draw scientists. Yes. There was a huge study. There have been a number of study about princesses, but there was one done um, an, a number of years ago where they had girls around the world drawing pictures, asking them, what does a princess look like? And girls, no matter where they were, what their skin color was, what their hair color was, they all drew white females with blonde hair. That was, they they were, <laughs> that's what they drew, right? And there's continuing studies. There's, mm-hmm. I think Disney, the D- Disney princess concept has been studied so much. We know it has tremendous impact. And I think one of the things I want to point out about that is, you know, we talk about these changes that have happened. And one of the things that concerns me is that Children's media, like everything else, is a business. And right now, when you watch media, we all know that media is about who has the most content. Netflix, Disney Plus is probably going to take over Netflix. Why? Because they're going to end up having more content that's relevant to to people to watch, right? So it's all about inventory. When you have inventory, a lot of that content isn't this great content. And not to say that everything new is great and everything old is bad, but there's definitely more awareness and inclusion in more recent content and inventory from 10, 15 years ago, which is still on all of those streaming platforms, is a little bit more like the old school Disney princesses versus some of the new things that Disney's trying to do with adding a bit more um, color and energy to their female lead characters, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a concern for, for parents when they're watching, thinking about, you know, what are we watching here? Are we watching stuff from, you know, when you're watching those old movies that kids love. So, and those are the ones you really want to be talking about because you might be able to say, Hey, when we're watching this, this movie, can we talk about, you know, Mulan or um, Mm -hmm. one of the more recent ones? What's the difference? Do you see the difference in that? Like Mm -hmm. there's a good way to do it too. too. I want to touch on that point of Disney movies because I had this conversation with parents online. So my kids are three, five and seven, and they started watching TV closer to two and a half for it was a in our home it was playtime till you were about two years old not much screen time and and then we brought in screen time and I as a new parent was the most excited to show my kids all the Disney movies (laughs) that I had watched when I was young and I'll never forget playing Cinderella for my my daughter she's she's the oldest but at that time she was about two and a half three and and showing her Cinderella and within like two minutes of the movie saying (gasps) oh 
what what is this? <laughs> this is not the lens that I watched the movie in. And and what, <laughs> what how can I? And then as the movie went on, I was like, should I keep playing it? Like, I don't think this is right. I can't. And and then moving on to the next and Snow White and all the movies and just really having this conversation with parents that we have such good memories and fond memories of these movies that like we grew up in and now like we loved the Disney princesses. But now I was hesitating to move on and forward and, and show my daughter and my boys now like these TV, these movies. They ended up watching them all, but I think they did start good conversations. And I saw play change after they watched a couple of those they fell into certain characters. My daughter was always the princess, which never happened in the home. By that time, let's say they were about three and a half, she was three and a half, four. And, and there was always a prince and my sons were the princes and she was the princess and they saved her and they came and swept her away and they were so small and they fell into that. And I was like, why am I so, I'm not happy with this, <laughs> but I, I wanted to show them that either one could have been that character anyway. So there was a lot of conversation that happened around that. Um, am I the only one that experienced this? And and <laughs> have you heard about this before? Well, it's common, right? Because all of mm. those movies are kind of reinforcing this kind of these this heteronormativity for one of another term, where mm. here's the way you have to act in this society to work. Yes, like, exactly. You know what you see, like you have to see it to be it. You know, there's so many phrases about how it influences your hopes and dreams and what you think you can do by what you see on screens. And a lot of those Disney movies, there's the shapes of the characters, um, how sexualized they are. Like there's so yeah. many things, even if you don't think they're sexualized, it's like the eyelashes, which really, like there's so many elements that have an impact. So uh, even I think this is a common conversation that parents have because it's really frustrating because you love them. And I think there's a couple of things. One, you want to remember that you thought this was normal growing up. And that is a good message for all of us to remind ourselves. Like I think about it all the time, how different the values were and that, helps, right. I think, us always thinking about our own implicit biases, because mm -hmm. we didn't grow up thinking, this is terrible. I mean, I remember as a girl thinking, I can do anything because I had <laughs> brothers. And I was like, eh. but you know, the truth was, you, you were told something else. Yeah. But it also reinforces that idea that you really have to be thinking about what your kids are watching and balancing it. It's important to balance that old content with something new and then talk about it, right? To have those contrasts. So is this, because when this is a common conversation you have with even those leading early learning centers, like in early grades where all the kids start to fall back into this, you know, oh, the princess does this. Oh, let's get married. And, and everybody says, oh, yes. it's okay. It's okay. But, yeah. you know, it's, you have to be engaging in conversations so kids understand this is just one way. And the great way to do that is to show shows where there are other things going on. The Bravest Knight has two dads and um, who are the dads of, like, so that's something different. So you can talk about that. And if, you know, depending on what your beliefs are, you can discuss it in a way that works for your own family, but just mm -hmm. to show that there's a range of families, you know, the most, the biggest growing family types right now are single parent families, mm -hmm. like single moms in particular, and step families. Mm -hmm. So are we seeing a lot of that on screen? I don't think so. So it's like, those are conversations you can have. Here's what we're seeing in this show. What do we see when you go to school or when you're playing with your friends or when we're at our relatives? Hey, do you notice that Uncle John and you know, Aunt Mary, this, you know, they both have kids from their first marriage or whatever, like different conversations. I think yeah. it just gets back to that. The most important thing to do is talk about it. And I know parents will say, we're busy. How can we do it all the time? You don't have to do it all the time. You just, you know, want to do it. And especially, you know, we find a lot that there's a lot of parents who watch when their kids are young, especially when they're watching, okay, whatever it is, Disney Plus or Netflix or a, a CDC, whatever they're watching. But maybe not paying as much attention on a platform like YouTube, which is one of the biggest platforms for kids watching. It's one of the top three preschoolers mm -hmm. too. And to me, that's one you really want to talk about too, because it's a bit of the wild west in the sense that, you know, I mentioned all of those people trying to make good creative content in a production company or a broadcast or a streaming service. And then you might have, you know, some guy who lives down the street who puts his kids on camera and puts a bunch of content out. So you can imagine there's a difference. And it's not that, it, again, that it's all bad, but there's a lot. I, I think we have found, and we actually are, have a research study we're doing right now. And I'm just going to say there's some issues there on YouTube in terms of what we're seeing. So yeah. those are the kind of things you also want to be looking at 
that because it's easier to pass a phone to a four-year-old or five-year-old right. where the YouTube videos go one after the other. And you mm -hmm. might know the first one's about, you know, some nursery song about colors, but the second one might be about something else. And then the third one, like Coco Melon, which is this right. super brand that started online, that's about as gendered, like mom stays at home, yes, dad goes noticed. to work, dad comes back with presents for the kids, the boys get rocket ships and trucks, the girl gets crayons. Like there's so much, every moment it feels like there's something you can talk about mm -hmm. in Coco Melon. Again, not to say it's all bad, but when you're putting on stuff like that, that has a lot more gender stuff, a lot more whiteness, a lot more old school nuclear family. It could be a show in the fifties. If it would have been done, you, you know, those are the ones you want to make sure you're talking about rather than just letting them play out. I don't have kids yet, but I had the exact same thought. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to show my kids all these <laughs> movies. I love them. And then until, once I got into this field, I told my husband, I'm like, our kids aren't watching. <laughs> no aren't Cinderella watching. in this house. <laughs> <laughs> and so I there's a study actually exactly what you said I pulled it up because I wanted to make sure I had the, it right but um, it, they found that engagement with Disney princess media and products was associated with higher gender stereotypical behavior one year later um, and then a similar, study, yeah, a similar study found that three to five year old girls pretend play revolved around things like beauty, clothing and accessories and um, like twirling, hand posing, things like that. When Disney princesses, prin Disney princess costumes were made available, I guess, in the experimental room. But when they weren't there, all of those patterns went away. Like their play was just, you know, normal play. It wasn't gender stereotypical play. It didn't, they weren't focusing on appearance or clothing. It was just, you know, kids being kids. So yeah, it's definitely has been shown to impact kids' behaviors and their play outside of the screen um, when they see things like that. I'm going to be the voice of some parents that I know are thinking certain things right now because I've had these, these discussions with them. What is wrong with my daughter wearing dresses and being a princess, right? So I've had this discussion. My, my sort of stance on this is that I want my kids to know that Anybody can watch a princess. It could be my boys. It could be my daughter. Anybody could be a princess in this home if they want to. I don't, I had, I showed them all those movies and then I just let them be whatever they want to be. There aren't any rules to play. Play is universal and there are, there's no gender to play. Right. So, however, I've had this discussion with friends where they're like, so what, like what's wrong with, with us letting them, the boys be boys and play with their trucks and the girls play with their dresses. What would you respond to that? What I would say is there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's what we're showing them is giving them the option to be able to experience all the different things that what a girl could mean. Mm -hmm. So if we're just showing them stereotypical media, then of course they're going to start adapting those behaviors and those messages. Mm -hmm. But as parents, I feel like it's the responsibility to pick different types of media so that they're mm -hmm. exposed to all these different types of toys. So not just buying dolls, but buying dolls and trucks mm -hmm. and letting them choose. And if they really show an interest towards one thing, you know, you don't have to go buy thousands of dolls to, to <laughs> feed that interest. <laughs> Got it. Keep the truck there just in case, you know, they change their mind and they want to play with that. Um, I think it's just important to give them the range of things so that they can experience all those things. Um, one quick thing, my work at Sago Mini, um, one of the parents I talked to was like, you know, I would never have known my child loved trucks and or my daughter loved trucks and diggers mm -hmm. if it wasn't for one of your apps. Because um, Sago Mini World, I don't know if parents listening are familiar, but there's like tons of worlds kids can explore. Um, and so it's giving kids those options. So they get to go, they get to choose what they want. And I guess this daughter just kept going towards the trucks and the diggers. <laughs> but we do have a fairy tales world and we do have like these other worlds. Um, so it's just giving them the options um to let them experience what they like and their dislikes and what their interests are and what they're curious about um mm. so yeah to end that I don't think there's anything wrong with it I think it's just allowing them to experience all of the things that that kids should can play with and not just tailoring to one gender or the other I, I love your answer because I think back to my childhood and I was what they would call a tomboy and I just loved sports. I loved sports so much 
And I ended up playing with the boys in the schoolyard because they were playing soccer and baseball and dodgeball and whatever that was. And I wasn't into dresses. They were so uncomfortable. I hated leggings and tights and jeans. And I just wanted to be in the comfortable clothing. Um, and I remember the struggle at home. I remember the struggle making friends because I was stuck in between <laughs> in a world that apparently wasn't my world. But why can't it be everyone's world? So I think that the inclusion part is you know, showing kids that it does, you don't have to be a tomboy. You can just be a girl that likes sports. Like, what's wrong with that? Um, so I know we're sh shifting away from that, but it's it's nice to see that it's being included in media as well. I found this research. I was reading writing something recently about how gender kind of is a social construct. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Like, we decide what it is, and then we repeat it, and we see it over and over again. And I found this really cool department store ad from 1918. And basically, it said... The generally accepted, this is about kids' clothes, the generally accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. Pink is a stronger color, so boys should have it. And blue is more delicate and dainty, so that should be for the girls. And keep in mind, you know, we all, we've seen all the royal babies. They have all those gowns on the boys, just like the girls. There's all these old, uh, kids used to always wear dresses to two, three, like, and then we decided something different. And then we decided something different. And then, so we're always changing and altering and sometimes totally emphasizing certain ways. So I think it really gets back to, you know, to build on what Adriana's saying. It's like, you want to give them options. And part of that is with media. Like that's one thing you can do. Look for a show that has a strong lead character doing STEM. Um, look for a show that has, and then balance that out. If Frozen's the big hit in the house, balance that out with Frozen, but do a match of things that is, you know, these Disney princess, but also these powerhouse girls. And there's so many more to choose from now. And, and also boys. And sometimes it's harder to find the boys who are uh, exhibiting a greater range of characteristics. Um, we see that all the time. And that's one of the things we encourage content creators to do, try to write boys. But we're seeing men do way more chores. Um, they might still be not the dishes of the laundry, but we're seeing men do more chores. We're seeing some improvement, right? But seeking out those shows where you see characters, like a preschool show like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, mm -hmm. the boys on that show are really um lovely there's awareness of emotions there's empathy there's caring about us all those great things so it's about maybe balancing so you find some of those ones that it's like the boys are superhero zap zip zap zoo and then add some more with some emotional depths and range of characters and seeing dads in different ways and not just the stereotypical assistive dad or absent dad or whatever like seeing different characters in a number of different ways so that you start to see this range and again that helps with those conversations too I'd love to understand a little bit more before we unfortunately have to end this conversation but I'd love to understand a bit of the the behind the scenes of research. So you mentioned you include children. How does it work and how, wh what sort of research do you do when you include uh, kids? With kids, we mostly do focus testing or user testing. So I'll talk about focus testing and then Adriana can talk about user testing. And focus testing is basically, it's often done with uh, projects that, you know, mentioned that when you're in development. So it might be something that's not complete. Um, before an animation is complete, there's something called an animation, which is like moving images, like all a bunch of, you know, flat images, not moving that are just put together. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get an idea. So oftentimes we're showing something like that and we're watching them to see how kids engage. Do they laugh here? Do they understand something? Mm -hmm. Do they look away? And then you're asking a number of questions about it afterwards in a variety of ways to engage um, get some answers that help content creators see where there are areas that can be improved, um, what does work and what doesn't. I mean, we obviously do a lot of research and have access to a lot of research and do our own. So we often have a pretty good idea. And then sometimes we're surprised by something that works or doesn't work when you actually talk to kids. So that's what we often do when we're doing kind of focus testing. So when it comes to children and let's say there's somebody who has a disability, do you use this kind of testing to understand how you would describe this disability in an age appropriate way? Well, I think we generally are when we're doing a program that has let's a child's neurodiverse or has a mm -hmm is in a wheelchair or is blind, whatever it happens to be, we're looking at experts to help us make sure it's authentic mm -hmm. and not so much looking to a kid to give oh, an it. expertise on that. Okay. But definitely we include, like we're really big on including diversity in our mm -hmm. 
um, focus testing to get some of that feedback. And it actually makes me think of something else that Adrian and I were part of a couple of years ago that was a really interesting study. We worked with the Black Screen Office and we did the kid, they did adults, some grown up stuff, but we mostly, we don't really care about kids and parents, but anyway, <laughs> but we did the kids component, which was, uh, the study was called Being Seen. And it was asking, so kids who were historically marginalized, you know, children of color, children with disabilities, um, to us LGBTQ kids. And from six to 16, I think we did it, 16 Adriana, something like that. Yeah. And we basically asked them about what they were seeing on screens, whether they saw themselves. And it was amazing to hear them because they had so much. I wish every content creator could sit and listen to those kids because they were so passionate. And especially the more marginalized they were, the more they had to say, because, you know, some of the kids could see there had been some improvements, but boys, those, the, some of the children with disabilities were like, they had so much going on about <laughs> what they wanted to see. And mm -hmm. I, I always say that to like to content creators, it's so easy to say, Oh, I remember when I was little, I love this. So the kids will love this. Or I have, you know, your research group of one, my, my daughter, my son, whatever loves this. It's really important to be talking to kids all the time, not like go every day, but if you don't have kids of your own, or if you just get away with it, it's like, it's really important because it's, you think one thing uh, when you're a producer, director, a writer, and it's, you know, to go and actually talk to a three-year-old when you're thinking about this idea, it's really a valuable thing because you realize it's different than you remember because we have these ideas that we can remember all this stuff and it's hard, right? So <laughs> it's hard. Yes. I uh, can't remember what I had for breakfast. So like, how can we possibly remember? <laughs> Adriana, what was the other type of testing? I know Kim uh, mentioned a different kind as well. Yeah. Um, at, at Sago Mini, at least that's my current role. So I'll talk about that. Um, we do a lot of user testing with our apps. So we kind of we bring kids into the studio or sometimes we do Zoom sessions and we see how they interact with the app. You know, like just like Kim said, like, are they interacting? Do they understand what they have to do? Um, Sago Mini is a very open ended world where kids can explore. There's no right or wrong answers. Um, so and there's and the characters are nonverbal as well. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure there's a very intuitive design that's easy for kids to use. Um, and so we watch them play with their apps and make sure that, you know, they're having fun and they're understanding um, but one of the things for at least app companies, you're kind of tailoring towards two audiences. So you're getting the parents who are the people that buy the apps, <laughs> um, but they only buy it if their kid enjoys it. So I do, t I do a lot of research with both sides of those. Um, and so one of the actually really cool things that we did recently, since we're on the topic of diversity and inclusion is, you know, we had to do some research for like what kids know about kitchens and what they understand about kitchens. Um, I know very random and I can't say much more than that. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so I just like recruited a couple kids and I had Zoom sessions with them and I've already I built a rapport with these families and they took me on tours around their their kitchen and they show what was in their cupboards and what snacks they like and what's in their fridge. <laughs> Um, and one of these girls from the States, there's a white family, she was six years old, and she pulls out these snacks that are Korean snacks. Um, and the mom was just explaining like, yeah, we go to the Korean store like almost every weekend and we have like, and she pulled out, I swear, a hundred of these snacks because <laughs> they're her favorite snacks. And so, you know, I went back to the team and I'm like, hey, like we need a diversity piece in this, this uh, topic that we're doing because, you know, like you don't think about those things, but yeah, kids are eating all types of foods, you know, sushi, like all those things, Mexican food, taco, like taco Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. I know it's a big thing in families. So it's one of the things that we're implementing and one of the things we're working on um, because of what came out of those interviews, um, which is really, really cool. But um, yeah, so we do user testing on our apps, but we also get inspiration from kids by just talking to them and, you know, showing us around their houses. <laughs> that sounds really creepy, but I <laughs> no, but I'm sure my kids would have brought you straight to the fridge and to the yeah. snacks. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I yeah. love that you guys are doing that. It's so interesting for me and I'm sure for this audience to hear what happens. We play Sego Mini, we we have it and and we have, uh, you know, my kids love it as well. And it's so fun to hear that there's so much thought that goes into what you're seeing, right? Like we know the goal is entertainment, but there's actual like there's actual thoughts that go behind that to make sure that there's a diverse like environment for our children so i love that you guys are doing that very very cool 
even with the focus testing, like I can see, like it's one of the really neat things is when somebody has a show, especially if they're trying to teach something and you ask them questions before they see the animated, you know, whether, whether it's finished or not, you ask them questions and then you show them the piece and you have this baseline. And it's amazing when a show has done something really well, where you get kids saying, oh, now I get this, like where you ask them mm. questions after the end and you see, and that's where there's success from, mm. you know, hopefully from us having given notes along the process where they suddenly you can say in that seven minute episode a kid went from knowing nothing about this topic and now they have all this knowledge so it's an, an amazing tool to kind of use as a kind of a starting line and then hopefully this amazing finish line I hope the parents that are listening to this really realize like how powerful you know kids media could be and and I think what I've taken from what you guys are both talking about is also that we we should have um an idea of what our kids are watching and, and maybe, you know, try to pick and choose certain things that we want to incorporate into their learning environment and, and their media. Um, to finish off this conversation, is there any um, last tips that you have or even TV shows you really recommend or, you know, apps? I know Sego Mini is an amazing app for all kids um, that you guys would just recommend for the parents. Well, I would say one thing about what parents can do, you know, I'm a big fan of media literacy. So talking mm -hmm. to your kids, starting that early, early, early. But I would also say speaking up, um, you know, Paw Patrol after the first season, a whole bunch of moms got on Twitter and, you know, hashtag include the girls. And that was a big reason why there was a second female character added, you know, have a voice and speak up. You know, I talk about what we just, we construct gender, we construct all these things. The only way change happens is when people speak up. So I'm a big fan of talking to your kids and also speaking up if you don't see what you like and, you know, making your voice known with social media, it makes it, that's one good thing about social media because you yeah. can get a lot of like-minded people on board really quickly. Um, so that's one of the pieces I think that that's helpful. That's really good advice. Yeah, I guess I will also say I don't want parents to feel stressed out about this, that they have to now go and like look at all the media that our kids are using because I know <laughs> parents are busy and can't do that because they're learning it from peers. They're learning it at yeah. school. They're learning it from parents at home and how they interact with others at the store and stuff like that. So um, I don't, again, I don't want parents to feel stressed out about this, but just to be a little bit more conscious about what your kids are seeing and what apps they're using and just doing a little bit more research into that um and just having those conversations when you can and when you have the time is is super important so I get it I don't want parents to feel overwhelmed as well but I think with the apps you're right in the sense that we choose what we want to add to our you know tablet and and phone but when it comes to screen like you mentioned Kim with YouTube and I think I see my kids with Netflix and and Disney plus they gain control a little bit. So if I give them, you know, an hour of screen time, I'm doing something on the side and they're clicking around and finding what they want to watch. And I try to, they know what they, you know, they're, they, they know they have to be in the kids section, but you know, it's happened a couple of times where I would peek in and watch what they were watching. And I was like, Oh no, no, that's not, that's not appropriate. There's like certain, <laughs> not Barbie, or there might've been Barbie or something else that my daughter chose. And the language was like a teenager and she was changing how she was speaking to me whatever mom <laughs> like what are you five like what are you doing but I, I realized that there were certain things so I, I do think that we have a responsibility to kind of sit with them every once in a while to see what they're watching and to number one even if we just hear a topic and say well I'm going to continue that conversation during dinner or later on I think we we do have that responsibility as well so it's not to place more work but just to sit near them every once in a while <laughs> and watch it well and you yeah. can also just like, especially as your kids get to the point where they are controlling things mm -hmm. more, you know, develop a habit of you pick something, but I want you to talk to me about it afterwards. Tell me like at dinner, tell right. me to show you, tell yes. me two things you found out. What was interesting in that show? Two things yeah. that stood out to you. And then again, it develops those habits of them looking for things yeah. to talk about. So they'll stop saying, oh, you know, so-and-so had a pink dress and might say, oh, it was really weird because I noticed that you know, all the dads worked and the mom stayed home or, or right. the girls were really quiet or whatever they said. Yeah. Like, I think that's mm -hmm. a, a great way to say you can pick what you want. Go pick something, but you got to tell me about it afterwards. I like that. I'm I'm struggling to stop this conversation. Thank you to both of you. Um, How do we reach you? Is there, I guess, to I know you guys have some um some articles that we can access on your website, right? On One Fish, Two Fish Consulting. That's where I, I, I read a couple things about you guys and your work. 
Um, yeah, still, is it one fish, two fish consulting dot com, and also the Children's Media Lab at Toronto Metropolitan U- University. If you just type in Ch- Children's Media Lab, you can actually read some of our research reports on there as well. Perfect. I will add the links to all these resources in the show notes to everyone who's listening uh, and the research articles that we mentioned will be added to those show notes um, as well. Thank you to both of you. And I look forward to our next conversation.